All right, a lesson for today. You know, you're having a conversation with someone, and it goes something like this. Your friend says to you, you know, I just don't buy all that judgment and hell stuff that you Christians believe. And you kind of him and haw a little bit. And uh, he says, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I just think about what I understand about God, and I think my understanding of God, there just, there just can't be hell. There can't be judgment. I just, I, I just can't believe that. And you pause for a moment, and you focus, and you look it in the eye, and you say, but it's in the Bible. But it's in the Bible. Judgment in hell is in the Bible. Jesus told us in Matthew 25, if you would turn there, we'll begin in verse 31. Important if true. Now, in that conversation with your friend, if they don't believe in the Bible, well, it's a very hard thing. And if they don't believe in the Bible, then you need to start there and say, Will you just hear this information and just give God a chance to reveal to your heart that it is true, and then we can go from there. But if they don't believe in the Bible, then it's a hard, hard thing to talk about. It's a hard thing to talk about if they do believe in the Bible. And, and, but believing in the Bible is the only way we're going to believe in what Jesus teaches here in this passage of Scripture. But give people a chance uh, to, to have the Holy Spirit work. Because we do know that when we teach people what the truth is, and we share with people what the truth is, it's opportunity for the Holy Spirit to go to work and convict. We know the Holy Spirit convicts us of judgment, It convicts us of our sin, and it convicts us of righteousness, the need for a Christ righteousness in us. So let's let's see what Jesus has to say here in this passage. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. This is after the tribulation that Jesus will come in all his glory. It will be different than his first coming. His first coming was, you know, it was just poor. There wasn't any fanfare other than the star, star which is a pretty big deal, and those that were drawn to the, to the uh, cave to see the baby Jesus. But when he comes again, it's going to be a completely different thing. He came as a servant the first time, and when Jesus returns, he will come back as king and judge. That's important for us to understand. And so when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him, in verse 32, will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I believe that's going to be a quite emotional experience. Now, the people aren't sheep and the people aren't goats, but they're like that. I, I've worked sheep in my life, and I've never worked with goats other than kick them and get them out of the way. But uh, I have separated the baby lambs from the mamas. I have separated hundreds of them. It is a very taxing day when you separate the lambs from the moms. And you've got a pen in the middle of the field, and you put them all in the pen, and you walk amongst them, and you reach down, and you pick up the babies, and you just put them over the fence. The noise, the crying, the, the just the pain that is coming from the mamas and the babies is, is quite... Man, it's really quite interesting. I can't imagine the pain of a clear separation here. Not will it just be sheep and goat separation, of course, but there'll be 
moms and dads separated. There'll be family separated. There'll be people that have been together all their life separated from one another. And there's a clear separation that is going to take place in this judgment. You know, the world, man, he rationalizes everything, and he wants everything to be in between. He wants everything to be gray. And at this judgment, there's going to be like it is in God's kingdom. There's very little gray in God's kingdom, and there's a whole lot of black and white, a whole lot of right and wrong, a whole lot of righteousness and unrighteousness. And that is clearly presented and clearly seen here in this scripture. In verse 33, and he will place a sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king, that's Jesus, will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. So the sheep are blessed. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So the sheep inherit the kingdom prepared for them by the Lord. And it has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the Lord has always been, and this preparation has always been being taken care of. It's an important thing to God, obviously. It's an important thing to our Father. It says in verse uh, 35, Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, the righteous. The righteous are people that have believed in Jesus for that Christ righteousness. They did not become righteous on their own. No sheep has become righteous on their own. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or when did we see you thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these My brothers, you did it to me. So, one of the markings, one of the clear markings of the sheep is works. It's works. Now, they are not sheep because of works. No one is righteous because of works. We are not saved because of works. No one is. We are saved by believing in Christ But the result of everyone's salvation is good works. Good works. You're going to do good things for other people. You are going to be the kind of people that do not allow people with real true needs to be unmet. You're going to do something about it. That's just who we are in Christ. And so, Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you? When you took care of people who were struggling, suffering, in difficult places, you help them. You help them. That's the result of Christ's righteousness. And then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. That may be one of the worst things I can think of here. Jesus comes in all his glory And he sits on his glorious throne. He is king. He is Lord of all. He is love to the nth degree. I mean, pure love. And they see it. They understand. And he says to those on his left, depart from me. Oh, gosh. Man, depart from me. He says, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from me is hell. And an eternal fire. 
is, un, I, I just can't, I can't go there with my loved ones. Not something I rejoice over, not something I celebrate, not something I'm happy about by no means. But it's Scripture. It's what Jesus said. If we believe the Bible, we have to believe this. Can't believe part of it. Not like Thomas Jefferson did. He just tore pages out of the Bible that he didn't like. You can't tear this out. It's God's words to us. Eternal fire departed. He says in verse 42, For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So to the sheep, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. To the goats, he says, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. So the difference between the sheep and the goats is what they did and didn't do. Let that soak for just a moment. Think about that for just a moment. What they did and didn't do. In verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment. You know, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus gives us a description of hell as being the place where the thirst is never quenched and the worm never dies. Intense fire. And I I can think about that in my mind, and I can think about a worm over a candle squirming. But when I think about people, I'm with you. I want to explain away hell. I'm with you. I want to say that's just man's idea. I'm with you. I want to say Jesus didn't really say this. It's got to mean something else. It's symbolic to just catching our attention and saying to us that we've got to be different than the world. We've got to be different than those who hate. We've got to be full of love and grace. And he's just telling us this to kind of catch our heart and say, you know, you know, be different. But it clearly says... And how foolish I think it is for us to read these words from Jesus and explain it away or ignore it or deny it because of the truth of it. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal punishment, eternal life. The words of Jesus, important if true. So what do we do? How do we respond? Hard to respond to that, isn't it? Difficult to respond to that. First of all, I think it's obvious. I think it's natural. We should respond with grief. It is proper living. It is truthful behavior that the idea of hell, the reality of hell, would break our heart. There are people living around you, there's people living around me that are unbelievers, unrighteous. And that means that they will depart from Jesus and they will live in torment for all of eternity. They're good people. They're moral, religious, 
even church going. Well behaved children, well manicured yard, clean car, well adjusted in the world, affable perhaps, but they have not believed in Jesus. They are unrighteous. There's got to be grief. There also should be zeal. Shouldn't the teaching of Jesus in this scripture produce zeal in us? A zeal to rescue the perishing, old-fashioned words, but a perfect perception of what it really is meaning for us to have zeal for the, the unrighteous, for the unbelieving, for the lost. A zeal to rescue the perishing. The ship is going down, and we need to send the lifeguards into the pool to the ocean. We need to send the lifeboats. We need to send the life preservers. We need to have a zeal for rescuing the perishing. We should be zealous because of hell. We should be, be open and bold and caring enough to tell them where the water is in the desert. You know, they say the sin of the desert is this, that you know where the water is, but you don't tell anybody. We need to tell people where the water is in the desert. There also should be what, there's got to be celebration. There's got to be celebration from us. I mean, there's no way around that. We can't go 24-7 with, with, with this huge burden on us. We have got to have some separation from it, but it needs to be a somber celebration that we, we never lose sight of the reality of unrighteous and eternal torment and live and go on autopilot and pretend like it doesn't exist, but we need to celebrate, and, and just frankly, we celebrate that we're not going to hell. It's got to be. It's got to be in our DNA. It's got to be in our workup. It's got to be on how we care ourselves and how we live. If not, I, I don't know that any of us would be emotionally stable. I mean, there's been people that have become emotionally bankrupt, psychologically bankrupt, because the idea of hell grips them so heavy. It's hard. It's hard to deal with. Most certainly is. But there's got to be that balance, and there's some room for celebration and we have that in Christ. I can't think of anything better to help us set up right priorities than eternal torment, eternal life. Eternal torment, eternal life. Eternal torment, eternal life. And that we would, knowing that, and we know that sheep and goats, clear separation, no in between, that we would have good priorities good priorities. We would not just be doing the better, we'd be doing the best. We would not just, just reach out to do good things, but we would reach out to do great things. Great things. I watched 60 Minutes this past Sunday night, and they interviewed a man by the name of Gregory Carr, an American. He was interviewed. Gregory Carr over creating made millions. Get this over. voicemail. <laughs> when I heard that, I went, "What? How do you get rich creating voicemail?" Well, he did, and I guess all those things. I wonder all those things that we just take for granted. Somebody made a killing, right? Voicemail. He's become a multi multi millionaire, and some years ago, like thirty years ago. He visited in Mozambique, the Gorongosa National Park. And when he visited, it's a million-acre park. And when he visited a me, uh, several years ago, uh, there was lions with, with uh, uh, broken, deformed legs because of uh, traps and landmines that the Civil War uh, had left. And... Hardly any giraffes, hardly any monkeys, hardly any zebras. Uh, all the animals were just mostly decimated by poachers and by hunters who, who didn't care. 
and it broke his heart. And he met with uh, the leadership and the government, and he offered his services, and they agreed to it. And he began a campaign 30-something years ago to rebuild this national park, a million-acre park. And it's really a good thing he's done. It's really an amazing thing that he's done. He started a long time ago, and, and, and since then, uh, they have gotten rid of all the dangers there to animals as best they could. Uh, they have restocked the national park with all the animals that belong there. And, and, they, and people say that as far as the safari is concerned, that, that this place, this national park in Mozambique is, is second to none. It's amazing. You see gorillas and you see the tigers and you see the lions and, and you see the giraffes and all the wildlife that's there. And not only did he do that, but all the surrounding villages, he went into those villages and he created jobs. He created jobs that would do work in the park and outside the park. He also created health venues. He, 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 he built medical clinics and he built, he hired doctors and nurses and, and stationed them all around the park. And then, uh, he started schools for the kids, and, and we try to raise lots of money for the school kids that we deal with through Elizabeth's Voice. You understand, in Africa, uh, there's no public school system. You have to, everything is private school. If you don't have the money, no education. Can you imagine how that perpetuates uh, Poverty when no one can get educated and work themselves out. That's why when I think about those children in Uganda, 120-something that that we're all helping to educate, uh, it, it does my heart good. Now, obviously, it's like a little small drop in the ocean, but it's a drop. It's a drop. And, and, and I think we've got three in college, and one's going to be a doctor, and he'll be a doctor. He's brilliant. He's, he's probably Sheldon. <laughs> he's Sheldon. He knows a lot of stuff. He knows a lot of stuff. And that man did that. And the guy that was interviewing him said, Mr., I hope you don't mind me asking this, but Mr. Carr, how much money have you spent? He was kind of you know, shy, shy away a little bit. He goes, Ugh. how much money have you spent on this project? He said, you know, I've heard rumors of several million. And Mr. Carr said, very low, very humble. He said, over $100 million. Over $100 million. Now I'm sure he's living well. I'm sure him giving a hundred million dollars to that is like me giving what ten grand, you know, probably. I mean, it's all relative, right? But the man's giving a hundred million dollars. Now, I think that's a wonderful thing. I really do. I, I would like to meet this man and talk with him. I, I love his passion. I, I love the idea of restoring the animals to the habitat. I love the idea of giving those kids school and giving their parents jobs and giving them health care. I love that. But you know, he's done a real good thing, but there was no mention of the best thing that he could do. No mention of the gospel. No mention of sharing Christ with those people. Now, it didn't say if he's a believer or not, and it very well could be that CBS just edited that, edited that out. I find that very easy to believe. And so I'm not being hard on the old boy, believe me, but I'm just saying in the context of that interview I saw, he has spent $100 million to help life here. And that's not the best thing. I mean, compared to eternal life, wouldn't it have been wonderful if he would use that $100 million or more to help people come to know Christ? That had been the very best thing. That had been the very best. It's the very best use of our money. It's the very best use of our time. It's the very best use of our skills. Consider eternal life, 
eternal torment. Consider people eternally, forever and ever and ever, suffering. Versus forever and ever and ever, just peace and grace and no more tears and no more hurt and no more pain. What else we should do about it? Well, we should grab a hold to our assignment and we should go at it with all of our heart, 100%. All of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, loving God completely and take a hold of our assignment, our assignment to help people know Christ. Our assignment to make a spiritual difference in this world. Our assignment that in the world that we are, in our present jobs and how we do our jobs, we are an ambassador, a representative of Christ in helping people come to be reconciled before God in Christ. It's the very best thing we can do. Identify through your assignment. Identify who the people are around you that are most likely to be separated into the goat pile. Man, identify them. Begin to pray for them. Pray for them with all your heart. Pray for them. If you've got a brother and sister who would be a goat today, pray for them. If you've got a neighbor who would be a goat, pray for them. And then earn the right to share the good news with them. You see, there's something that we forget that we need to be reminded of, and that is this. You work with people, and you are surrounded by people, and, and you go to ball games with people, and you sit in the stands with people, and, and, and they hear about your world, your life, and they know that you believe in God. They're probably going to hear you say, that knucklehead preacher had us go up there, and I gave up my favorite purse. And you did what? What did you do at church? I've never heard of that at church. Yeah, I, I'm not going to take a purse back to church. I'm going to get me a little... I'm going to get me something I can travel light with. I sure ain't taking my best purse back to church. Yeah, I'm going to think about the shoes I wear. I'm looking at these shoes around here, and I'm going, whoo. Hmm. Earn the right to share the gospel with them. They're wondering, you believe in Christ? You believe, if I understand what the Bible says, this is that person now in your life that know about you being a believer and you're going to church, and they wonder, that guy believes in hell, and he's never told me about Christ. He's never said anything to me about it. Man. But you know people think that. They, they I mean, there's a spiritual world, and there's spiritual dynamite going on, dynamos going on in dynamics. That's what I was trying to say. It's happening, and they're asking that question. And they're wondering why in the world you are so, so supportive and so surrendered to your religion. That's how they would frame that. But you haven't talked to them about Jesus. Because Jesus is the only answer we have to help people not experience an eternal torment. It's a heavy subject, isn't it? It's a difficult subject. But if we're going to be faithful to God and true to his words, we must talk about it. We must talk about it. You might be here today and you're pretty convinced you'd be a goat. Man. Man. Don't you need to be saved today? Don't you need to believe in Jesus today? You hear the Holy Spirit showing you that today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying to you, listen to the words. Listen to the words. And there is within you a, a want, a desire to believe, to trust Him to turn your life over to him, and it's, it's hard. And right now, the Holy Spirit is so at work with you, you're, you're just finding any reason to, to, if you could, the shame wouldn't be so much, you'd probably just get up and leave right now. It's hard on you. Why don't you just be set free? Why don't you just come to know Christ today? 
just right here. You, you may have been a church member for a long time. Man, heaven and hell, let's, get, let's, let's fix that. Let's fix that today. Our, our band is going to sing. There's, they're going to sing, we can live for God because of what Jesus has done for us. Because he lives. And as they sing, come, kneel at the altar of God. And pour your heart out and say, Lord, I need you in my life. I, I, I want to make sure I'm born again. I want to make sure your spirit's in me. I, I want to be sure that I'm one of your children. And you would just come and kneel at the altar. If, if you need to talk with someone, I'll help you. I'm going to turn my microphone off in a minute and no one will hear. And, and, and just come. You also may need to come because you've been... You've been neglecting your life, calling, your assignment. You've identified those people who are lost, but you had nothing about it. You know you hadn't. You haven't invited them to come to church with you. You haven't invited them to come to Bible study with you. You have not attempted to share the gospel with them. You want to, but you just don't do it. And today is enough, isn't it? You've been reminded of eternal torment and eternal life. And enough, so enough. You just come and rededicate your life. Get right with the Lord. I mean business. Boy, do we need to be business. Eternal life, eternal torment. What is decision? Band, come and sing for us. And I'm going to pray. And after I pray, if you want to come and kneel at the altar and, and decide to follow the Lord the rest of your life, please. Please do. Heavenly Father, I pray your Holy Spirit will speak to the heart's that need to respond today, and nothing would hold them back. Lord, we believe your word. We believe your truth. We believe what we have read today, and we believe, Lord, that decision must be made here while there's still time. Oh, God. Oh, God, I plead, please work in the lives of people. May they come for your glory to become your child today. May they come to become your ambassador today. To represent you well in their homes, in their jobs, on their streets, in their places of business. May your spirit penetrate our hearts. the opportunity we still have to make this choice, to make this decision. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you would sit, stand and sing with all your heart, the altar is open. Please come and leave today in the right spot between you and the Lord. Will you come?